when you look across the landscape, most um, sports book applications and, and iCasino services um, look and do the same thing. Every digital experience, all the way down to your weather app on your phone, right, is personalized um, right. to to what you're interested in. The backbone of our um, technology platform is really based on AI and ML, and utilizing the technology that we've developed um, to bring users closer to the things that they're interested in in a contextual way. Now it's companies like you that I think are going to change the game for a lot of people. We think. I hope so. I, you know, I, yeah. we, and we'll be watching. Hi, everybody. Today we're joined by Chris Reynolds, CEO and founder at Epoxy AI. Uh, Chris, uh, we know you have a pretty interesting uh, background story, but you know, please tell the audience uh, how, you, how you got to Epoxy AI and, and why you founded it. Uh, thanks, Russell, and, and, and good to be on the show, um, Kevin and Russell. I, we appreciate it and um, looking forward to sharing our story, uh, our story with you. So uh, my partner and I, Jason, have been, um, and, and for that matter, the, the leadership team here have been working together now through three separate companies, this being our third. Um, back in 2011, we started a company, uh, founded a company, I should say, called uh, 12C. And that was really um, a technology platform that was focused on creating game center type experiences for um, for 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 viewers of uh, professional and collegiate sports. So um, at the time, the a, a use case started to develop um, and was kind of proven out that that uh, while while folks were watching sports, they were also looking for additional information about that game or match on their phone, uh, player information, team information, matchup information. And we had a concept to kind of take um, all that real-time data that was being generated and created from, from the game or the match, uh, visualizing it and then personalizing it for the end user, and then integrating that experience into things like smart TVs, uh, cable set-top boxes, web publishing um, websites, uh, as well as we had some we had some partners that wound up actually integrating it into the broadcast coverage itself. And uh, really what it did was um, give um, the end user, uh, the, the viewer, a, um, a, a, a personalized and or um, very granular look and understanding of all the statistical content um, around that game or match. And we visualized it and infographics that we're updating in real time. Um, a lot of the technology and experience um, side of the, uh, the the business is still being used today by um, by Xfinity. Um, some of it's been integrated into Sky and and and, and NBCU around things like the Olympics. So we uh, we started that business in 2011 and scaled it up where we were serving. Um, most of the major cable operators uh, here domestically and up through um, Canada as well. We were working with folks like LG and Samsung as far as integrating experiences into their um, smart TV lines. Uh, and, and Comcast became um, our biggest customer. And um, the service um, became very sticky with, with their customers or their users. Uh, and they wound up acquiring us in, in 2016. We um, we stayed with uh, with Comcast for uh, a number of years, actually five years. Um, it was a really interesting opportunity for us and the whole team. Uh, we continued to kind of build out their sports experience uh, there, pretty holistically um, across um, their 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 video plan. Um, I was fortunate enough while I was there to also um, become really involved in the streaming business um, that the company was getting into. So bringing um, streaming services into the Xfinity ecosystem, things like Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu, and enabling users to um, or their customers to access those applications and services directly through your set-top box, and then integrating all the metadata associated with the programming on those services into kind of the traditional guide environment. So one of the biggest challenges today for um, folks that are streaming is kind of um, aggregating all the um, or understanding all the content that you have access to and aggregating that into one place. And that's something that Comcast has done 
very effectively, and I was really glad and happy to be a part of that. Um, while we were at Comcast, though, we also, um, in 2019, um, understood and saw um, the, the, the repeal of PASPA and um, got a really a front row seat to the, um, I'd say, the melding of uh, sports entertainment and sports, sports betting um, and thought we, we came up with a concept, I should say, that um, if you had the ability to kind of personalize that experience by using things like metadata and data and um, user history and, and a bunch of other um, uh, characteristics that um, you could create a pretty interesting experience um, for, for bettors and for sports fans. And so uh, we started kind of kicking around the idea in 2020. And um, frankly, we, we really wanted to do something at Xfinity, but the company just wasn't ready at that time to dive kind of headfirst, like most, into the gaming space. And so we decided uh, as a team to kind of spin, spin it out on our own and set up a business that was really, and is today, really focused and, 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 and driven towards bringing kind of hyper-personalization into um, the gaming space, whether that be sportsbook, iCasino, we're even starting to apply um, our models into CRM. The backbone of our um, technology platform is really based on AI and ML and utilizing the technology that we've developed um, to bring users closer to the things that they're interested in in a contextual way. And I'm looking forward to talking to you guys more about that as we get, get as we move along. And uh, just out of curiosity, when <clears throat> Comcast acquired Want to see, did they kind of have their sights on uh, PASPA being repealed at that time, or, or was that just kind of happenstance that it happened. <laughs> I think it was more happenstance that it happened. And so because of the, 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 the types of things that we were working on prior and while we were at um, Comcast, um, you know, we were that that Comcast deals with all the major broadcasters and, and content providers across professional and collegiate sports. Um, we were at the same time talking to and having meetings and conversations with um, some of the big, bigger betting operators at the time, and also um, the fantasy providers. So if you got, you know, obviously FanDuel and DraftKings were um, strictly in the fantasy business before the repeal of PASPA, um, but, but we, we had a good inclination, and, and I think so did the rest of the market, that some of these fantasy services were going to turn into real money gaming services, and that the traditional brick and mortar or land-based operations were also going to get into sportsbook as well. Um, in a, in a much broader regula regulated way. Understood. Um, and you know, with Epoxy, I mean, you started the company prior to the AI, you know, revolution here or boom, <laughs> however you, we want to call it. Um, how has it helped you coming in like so early, you know, in, you know, in, into the AI game really kind of, you know, basing the company on AI, ML before things really developed in a significant way as they have today? Yeah, and I would argue, um, Russell, that they're still developing. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, would, I would, you're right. We were early um, with our assumptions. I think it's taken probably a good year and a half to two years um, for the market um, to start to really kind of fundamentally understand the impact that um, AI is going to have on kind of every aspect of your life, but, but specifically the gaming aspect and the type of efficiencies it can create um, and the type of opportunities it can create. And so, um, you know, when you look at the, the broader global sports betting market, um, it's interesting because if you know, take a step back and look at what's happening here domestically, there's still um, there's still a lot of time and energy, and rightfully so, put into market access. There are still new entrants coming into the space. Mm -hmm. um, there's 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 a certain level of kind of maturity that's starting to kind of shake out as far as who the uh, the dominant services uh, by market share are. 
Um, and so it's still nascent in a lot of ways, um, but also hardening up in some ways. But when you look more broadly across the globe, what you find is very mature services um, that are now looking to um, augment their traditional offering based on, frankly, technology. And not they're not as interested in market access. They are still, but it's not the primary driver. It's more, um, it's more focused on differentiation and, um, and, and creating a, a better, more friendly user journey and uh, a more appealing one um, to, to, to continue to be competitive. And, and that's starting to happen here domestically as well. Um, but you know, again, zooming out for a second, um, when you look across the landscape, most um, sports book applications and, and iCasino services um, look and do the same thing. Um, to the end use, right? There's very little differentiation um, across most of um, the experiences, not all of them, but most of them. Um, we don't really see this industry any different than, you know, an e-commerce industry. And if you think about e-commerce and the e-commerce companies that have been successful um, globally, they've spent a tremendous amount of time, money, and energy utilizing things like AI and ML um, spending a lot of time, money, and energy on user journeys um, and, and optimizing those. That necessarily hasn't happened yet, uh, but we'll, we believe in the, in the gaming space, but we believe that we're kind of on the cusp of it as far as turning the corner and, um, and operators spending more time and money um, optimizing the user journey. Uh, because just like e commerce, a, a betting offer has a certain margin associated with it, just like any other. Um, e-commerce product and uh, you, an operator's job is to get someone to engage with an offer um, and then continue to engage with offers that are presented to them that are um, contextual and timely to what uh, the end user is interested in. And so um, I think it's a, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit slower moving process, but it's definitely, um, the market is definitely shifting and um, I think that's good for us. And you know what's always been uh, a mystery to me is uh, <clears throat> uh, from a user perspective, like how um, much feedback from from users is is actually being incorporated into development, not only of the sports books but also product like yours. Like I, I've heard of like user groups that a fan film I have, and they talk to the users, but it, it doesn't seem like it's as um, uh, I guess widespread as I would think it would be because uh, a lot of assumptions are made for users, right? With these sports books. Um, but but how, how does that kind of feedback or information flow between? You know, yeah, it's a great question. And, and there's a couple of different ways to answer it. Um, you're right. Um, in the sense that um, user studies and user feedback and surveys, um, there, there's companies that conduct them, um, and 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 that data is taken back into said said operator. Um, it's not as pervasive, frankly, as it should be. And, and and even if it even if it becomes more pervasive, some of the technological challenges to integrating that feedback are some of the um, kind of core hurdles in this industry that um, that. Um, that, that it's going to have to figure out how to get over. And so what do I mean by that? So um, a number of operators here domestically and even internationally, um, they license their, their, their gaming platforms from platform companies. Um, and those platform companies in a lot of ways are also responsible for the innovation that happens within um, those, those betting services. And so um, it, a lot of, a lot of user feedback and 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 uh, user studies and and the data that's taken from them. Um, there's a, there's there's great intentions associated with with all of that feedback and applying uh, that feedback into experiences uh, for the end user. But um, there's a bottleneck, frankly, with um, with the platform providers because they're serving say 80 customers globally who all have a wish list of things that they would like to see integrated into their, um, into their iCasino or sports, sports app, sports betting app. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a, a get in line type of scenario. Now, 
um, some of the more mature operators here domestically, um, as well as internationally, have um, gone through great lengths to kind of build or compile um, their own platform, which allows them to have a lot more flexibility in the types of enhancements that they can bring to bear in a much more rapid fashion. And so, um, and I think, you know, uh, that's evident in when you look at services like FanDuel and, and DraftKings and, and MGM and, and Caesars to some level, as well as kind of what Fanatics is attempting to do and, and doing um, by either buying a platform or building one from the ground up. Frankly, that's where you need to be in this space um, to control, I, I think, um, your destiny moving forward as far as innovation and being ahead of the curve. Um, and I think what's what's happened is, and, you know, you, a lot of these operators are reliant on a vendor relationship that they have with their platform provider and everyone has the best intentions. But um things just don't move as quickly as you would like them to because of the number of customers a particular platform provider has that all have a wish list of things they'd like to integrate and make happen as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That yeah. Makes sense. You know, I, I, I like <clears throat> everything you're doing, you know, when we first saw you at uh, G2E and you're talking about hyper personalization, I think we hit, I hit Russell because I think everybody we've brought on, we've asked about personalization and where it's going in, in sports betting. So you're, what you guys are doing, you know, we look at it, who is the next Netflix, you know, sports, like you said, everybody is the same, right. And then there, and then there was Netflix and then in music, you know, there was Apple and there was, you know, there's all these services and then Spotify came on and it was personalized and they became the dominant player. So the consumer as an entertainer is used to this personalization you know, when you see that switch flipping and who, you know, going towards who becomes the next Netflix or Spotify and, in, in, you know, sports betting. It's a great it's a great point and a great question. Right. So um, you're right, Kevin. Um, this industry, frankly, shouldn't be any different than the music industry or the video industry as far as how those products and services are designed um, to meet the user. Um, where they want to be met, right? Putting right. the right things in front of them at the right time to get them to engage and, and drive frequency and retention. And there's no better examples than, than Spotify, um, Netflix, um, YouTube, Amazon. Um, the, 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 the betting industry, the gaming industry in general is starting to take some cues from these other digital experiences, right? Um, if you think about it, every digital experience all the way down to your weather app on your phone, right, is personalized um, right. to to what you're interested in. And so it's it's a it's inevitable that this is going to happen. I think that there are um, a few of the bigger operators here in, in the United States, like FanDuel and DraftKings that are starting to and, and Fanatics for that matter, that are starting to lean into personalization in material ways to do the same types of things that, that Spotify and, and Amazon and Netflix. Um, now it's just second nature to them, um, but it's going to take some time. Right. And, and I think that, um, I think that, you know, we, we serve everyone. So I have to, um, I have to manage <laughs> how I state this, but I think what, what you're, what you're seeing and what you'll continue to see is that, the digital native experiences like the Fandals and the DraftKings and the Fanatics um, will probably continue to adopt these characteristics and traits uh, a little bit more rapidly than um, your traditional land-based operators who are um, you know, still digitizing for, for, for lack of a better uh, term, their business, right? And so um, I think you know, we have a good relationship with, with, with FanDuel and DraftKings and, and, and the folks at Fanatics, and, and I definitely think they're well on their way to getting there uh, and, and already starting to implement um, some of these characteristics that, that, that really create a personalized experience for the end user. Yeah. And, and it's really, it sounds like the technology is a, kind of a hindrance to um, – you know, some of the innovations that, or at least that it's slowing down the release of 
innovative, I guess, features, right? Yeah. The sports books. I, I, it's, it's technology and talent, right? So yeah. um, mm -hmm. you, you have platform providers for, for sitting from where, you know, for our view, um, you have platform providers that may or may not have an AI practice. Um, they, if they do, they're probably just, um, yeah, they've probably just begun to kind of put a team together over the course of the last 12 months. Um, personalization isn't second nature to, uh, you know, to most platform providers or to, you know, or this industry just in general, besides outside of affinity and, and rewards cards and things like that. And so it's, um, it's, it's, it's not a, it's, it's a different type of thinking and it's a different type of approach and it's an investment, right? It's a, it's a big investment. Um, yeah. AI engineers aren't cheap. Um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of testing involved. There's a lot of failure involved. Um, so you have to be patient. And so it's a, it's a patient capital type of investment that, um, that you have to make. It's going to yield fruit over time and then couple that with, uh, kind of a brittle, uh, in a lot of ways, um, uh, technology stacks and platforms that a number of operators run on, um, you know, using, using the video business as an example, someone like an Amazon prime or a Netflix, or even an Xfinity now, um, they design their platforms, um, to integrate other services around it or into it. Right. Um, and they're, they're purposely built to have a runway for like a partner like us to come in and say, okay, here are our APIs. Here are the things they do. They hand us some documentation. We understand that. And we integrate into those platforms. The gaming industry is not set up like that. It's just not, it's getting there. Um, but these aren't necessarily open platforms with vibrant marketplaces. <laughs> um, it, it's definitely improving. Um, and, and, and we've seen kind of, you know, uh, quantum leaps over the last couple of years. Um, but um, it's still not there yet. Yeah, it's interesting that it sounds like, uh, yeah, even though technology will wind up probably being the, the key to, I guess, the winners of the sports betting market when everything is said and done, it was uh, maybe not brought to kind of the, the, the forefront of the priority list when everybody went live because it was all about market grab. Yeah, it was, it was a race. It's, it's a yeah. race, right? Every market... And there's still, um, yes, it was a race for uh, market access, kind of a land acquisition type of situation where you get into a market and um, whether it's a, whether it was a Pennsylvania, New Jersey, kind of you pick one in Ohio or Maryland and you move as quickly as you can and spend a lot of money to try to acquire customers. I think the days of spending, you know, a tremendous amount of money on customer acquisition costs are, are fading because they have to. It's just too expensive for most operators to go out and, and spend the type of money that they've spent historically to acquire customers. And so they need to have better, uh, more efficient and effective products to do that. And I think the other piece to this is, um, you know, there, there's still large swaths of the population that um, don't have regulated gaming right yet. Yeah. So look at Texas and California and Florida is kind of coming online right now. You know, between those three states, you're 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 knocking on close to 100 million new users, um, and or potential users, um, and 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 so to do that and to acquire kind of the casual gamer and to acquire kind of the the I may be interested in gaming, but I you know I, I don't understand these applications. If you know, if you put put a betting app or a, an I casino on I casino, is slightly easier to understand, but a, a sports betting app in front of um, your spouse or your friend that doesn't bet and ask them to do something, right? They, they, they don't, they don't understand them. Um, and so that, that leads to a trust issue, which leads to, a um, you know, a, you become gun shy to do anything. And so for, um, the business to kind of meet the projections that, um, were set in front of it years ago around acquiring lots, millions and millions and millions of kind of, um, uh, repeat users, these experiences are going to have to become more user-friendly, more personalized. At least that's how we see it. Yeah. How are you working? Like, so you work with all the, let's say the platforms. Now, looking at your technology, is this something that you talk to leagues about as well? Like, is there applications now that, because the leagues were kind of like, oh, sports betting's over here, but now they're embracing it. And, and I would think from a metadata or a data 
conversation? Are you in conversations with some of the more uh, aggressive leagues? Yes, we absolutely are. And so um, kind of across the board, we have kind of an ongoing dialogue with, with a number of the major professional leagues, um, racing as well. We, we've worked in the past and continue to have a great relationship with folks like NASCAR. Okay. Um, yeah. As far as kind of some of the other big sports, we talk about baseball for a second. We've, we've had an ongoing dialogue with them around, um, around uh, personalization as it applies to folks that don't want to see betting advertisements when they open up something like an MLB.com, right? So you may be a user that's just not interested in betting and you don't want to see the offers for whatever reason. Um, How do you, um, how do you create an experience or how do you create a a, a seamless way to deliver that experience to the end user by using our technology? Um, We work with um, media platforms as well that are, starting to lean into a watch and wager type of scenario or a potential watch and wager uh, scenario where, uh, you know, Kevin, you're watching a game on TV and you want to engage with that through a betting application and do something that's either kind of real time or just associated with what's going on on the field or during the game. How do you sync your, your phone up to, to that game to create a, a seamless experience? And so, um, yeah, our, our, um, uh, we work with the platform providers, the gaming platform providers. We're working with media companies around watch and wager and the integration of kind of betting content into a video stream. And then obviously we work directly with operators as well and leagues. Um, and uh, I think that you're just going to see more uh, come out of the leagues um, and the leagues be associated with more um, types of uh, gaming uh, just because the there, there's such a direct <laughs> Uh, correlation to someone that's watching a game and interested in betting on that game. I think that technologically, um, the 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 uh, the hooks, I should say, and and the the ability to kind of do some of the forward thinking um, things is um, hasn't been there. But um, as these video streaming platforms become more uh, sophisticated, as the user experience on the phone uh, becomes more um, adapt, adapt, I should say, to um, to these types of scenarios, you're going to see more of it. And we know just from talking to some of the bigger operators that they're, they're definitely leaning into those types of experiences because it, it helps them create a moat as well. And, I, and, I, and, and maybe I would assume, you know, this responsible gaming conversation as well. You know, we, oh, we talked to, to Maddie about that at Fanatics and what she's doing with AWS. And I'm sure the leagues may look to someone like you with those type of initiatives. Exactly. Excuse me. And so, um, yeah, speaking of AWS and just a good plug for us and maybe for them, we're the only uh, AIML real money gaming partner on, on their network. And so uh, whether it's responsible gaming and, or kind of innovation, uh, we're, um, we, 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 we continue to kind of talk and work around those areas. There's a lot of companies that, that, that do a good job uh, around uh, responsible gaming. And that's kind of an industry within itself. I think we can be um, helpful and, um, and can add value around design, you know, using our services to kind of create a responsible gaming uh, experience for users that are kind of looking for that or going back to my ML, MLB example. Um, yeah. And with the, uh, your comment about the, the video or, or watch and, and bet or, um, uh, I mean, what, I think what, what the, um, NFL has done providing their feed to some of the sports books, I mean, that has been really impressive. Um, my complaint and you know, Kevin's heard it, you know, for a long time is, is that the, the video always lags what's really happening real time, especially on, on TV. But in the past, um, um, you know, like some tennis matches are streamed within some some of the sportsbook apps. And even that stream is like four or five seconds behind. But the NFL one, I mean, it, it was r- real time. I was very impressed. And the quality was superb. Yeah. No, um, latency is a real issue. Right. And um, yeah. there's, there's ways to um, there's ways to address it. Uh, and I think it. And it also has to be um, 
watching wager scenarios work very well when you have multiple sports kind of opting in or multiple leagues opting into um, making their streams available for um, for for video platforms uh, and and operators to um, to take advantage of. And so, um, yeah, what what the NFL is doing right now is really interesting, and and how they're making their feeds available, and, and inevitably how they'll be used in a in a gaming environment um, is 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 very interesting. I think um, the same things will inevitably happen with. MLB, NBA, and NHL, uh, PGA and tennis, and, and obviously soccer. Um, and it's just a function of time. The, the, the challenge is um, it's the rights associated with the video, right? And, uh, and not to kind of dive too deep into that rabbit hole, um, but you know, broadcasters pay a set fee for certain rights to certain video feeds and, and broadcast rights to professional and collegiate sports. Um, so it, it, it's, um, it's, it's tricky right now in the sense that, um, the, the, the rights side of the house has to get figured out. Everyone has to figure out how to benefit from, um, from, from, from making them more readily available across multiple platforms. You'll see things like different camera angles, um, being integrated into certain, um, betting services and, and applications uh, for certain sports that that's great. Um, and, and it's a good first start. But there's, um, there's some things that either have to be uh, unwound, or, um, or, or figured out, I should say, to become more pervasive. But yes, that's definitely directionally, uh, what's going on in the industry. And then, um, then you have the platforms themselves um, that are that are looking to kind of take advantage of that use case whether it's kind of a, on a play-by-play -play basis, on a per half basis, per quarter basis, per period basis, where the latency aspect of things doesn't come as much into play, right? So there's still a way to create a, um, a connected experience uh, without having to rely on second-to-second -second latency to, to solve it. We've actually developed, that was one of the first things that we did because this use case we completely believe in it just hasn't um, it hasn't become as pervasive as is is I think the whole industry would like it to be. Um, we actually developed a, a, some a patent around that particular use case of what you're watching and being able to synchronize your phone to what you're watching based on a unique audio detection service that we developed um, that's really inexpensive to use and 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 light on the client. But I think we're still some 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 years away from it becoming a, a pervasive activity. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, as we wrap up here, um, we typically ask, you know, where do you see kind of uh, the next few years? How do you see the next few years unfold? I think you gave us a lot of that <laughs> during the conversation, yeah. but very visionary. Is there, yeah. Is, are there anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> well, I, I, I think, you know, just going back to some of the points that we hit on, I think that personalization is going to become just more directly personalization services that, are, that, that harness AI are gonna become um, just more holistic and integrated into user experiences. I think you're going to see video platforms build on top of the sports experiences that they've already integrated, the folks like YouTube TV and Amazon Prime and Xfinity. I think it's a natural extension for those platforms and others um, to understand how to take advantage of, of, of gaming in a thoughtful way. Um, I think that's, that's inevitable and it's going to happen within, it, it is happening, but it's going to be just become a, a more um, integrated type of uh, uh, service. And, and I think that, um, I think over time, um, you're going to see, um, you're going to see additional states come online like California and Texas. And I also think um, you're going to see more players enter the market with um, digital only or digital first, I should say. Uh, okay. And, you know, we'll see. And I think that there's, um, looking outside of the United States, I think there's going to be um, big changes across Europe as well. And, and, and as far as how, how gaming is delivered, how it's understood, and um, it, it's going to be an interesting couple of years. Yeah. Very yeah. good. 
looking forward to it's it. It's been great. Yeah. No, and, and it's good to have it's it's good to have you in the mix for the game, you know, your company, because it's it's something since we started this series that we've been scratching our head like, when is someone gonna really step up the personalization? You know, understanding that like you said, it was a rush to get everything up, but now it now it's companies like you that I think are gonna change the game for a lot of people. We think. I hope so. I you know yeah. I and we'll we be watching. It. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll keep you guys posted and updated as we continue to grow. Great. Um, really appreciate the time, guys. Thanks, thanks. for um, thanks for having me. And hopefully um, some of this was uh, a little bit helpful or insightful. And otherwise, uh, again, thank you. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. This thank was you. fantastic. Appreciate your time. Mm -hmm.